hey, it's going to be a good Sunday. It's a good Sunday because I believe that um, you're not a church unless there's community. You're not a church unless there's the word being preached. You're not a church unless there's the presence of God. And you're also not a church if you don't come together for things like communion and baptism. And today we're going to be baptizing some people, which is going to be really exciting. And, um, and especially exciting, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess something real quick. Um, today I'm feeling old. I don't know if Jill said this, I just got here, but it's Chase's birthday. He's going to turn 18. He's turning 18 today. So like, I'm feeling older than a mug right now. And, um, but what makes it exciting and not depressing is that yesterday, um, he knew that we were baptizing some people today and I've never been to that pastor to kind of force our kids into, uh, you know, having a relationship with God. I was like, I just wanted them to like me lead by example and then, and then they follow. And so I never pressed them. You know, I wasn't that pastor that made their kids get baptized at the age of four, you know? Um, so I'd always wanted him just to choose it. And so yesterday he's like, Hey, you know, we've been thinking about it, praying about it. And, uh, I want to get baptized tomorrow. So as we're inaugurating him into manhood he's also getting baptized. So that's a special day. So you know, you know, <laughs> ladies, why do you do this? This is not even aerodynamic. Like close your fingers. Why is it like this? Anyway. <laughs> oh yeah. Why are you, <laughs> you cover your nose? Your nose is not the thing that's tearing up. I don't want you to do that. Anyway, but yeah, I feel you today. I feel you today. It's going to be uh, an awesome day. <laughs> uh, anyway, now you're going to think of me when you do this next time. You're welcome. Um, so we do things in series because I, I, a, I don't want to sit here and preach to you four hours. You want, you don't want to be under a four hour teaching. So we break things down in series. And, uh, today we're starting a series that I titled the complete idiot's guide on messing up relationships. All right. Pastor Mike, that's really negative. Here's, I, I did it for two reasons. Number one, we're in New Jersey and we speak, we're very fluent in the language of sarcasm. Come on, somebody. Very fluent in the language of sarcasm, as well as uh, some of you know that I've been traveling a lot and um, been doing a lot of coaching and consulting. And one of the consulting practices that I have with some churches is that I ask them reverse engineering type of questions. And one of the questions I ask is this, is okay, if you wanted, if you wanted to reject any new person coming to your church, what would you do? And we would whiteboard that together. If you didn't want anyone to feel welcomed in your church, what would you do? And they start writing it down. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just ignore them when they walk in. Don't give them information, da da da. And then I give them a red marker. And okay, circle anything that you guys have, 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 can admit that you've done in the last six months. Oh, crap. And then they go around. So yeah, we do this, we do this. And sometimes it takes our mind reverse engineering something in order to come to a state of awareness. So I want to reverse engineer relationships here. How do you mess up relationships so that we can avoid the pitfalls in the relationships in front of us? Because here's what I want. My desire for Fervent Church is this. My desire is for Fervent Church to be passionate about relationships. Okay? To be passionate about relationships. Not only that, to care about relationships just as much as God cares about relationships. Because I believe he does care about relationships. And get to that place where we supersede society. Because right now in society, relationships are very disposable. Can I, talk, can I talk to somebody today? Right? If I'm not feeling someone, unfriend, unfollow, unblocked. That's my favorite one. Right? Relationships are incredibly disposable. But if we value them, we shouldn't be able to quickly throw them away. And, and I know, and I know that relationships are complex. I know that relationships are sometimes messy, but they're valuable. They're valuable. And in fact, in fact, Genesis 126, I'm reading from the message version. This is God spoke and he said this, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. Do you notice the plurality there? He said, let us, Wait, I thought we served one God. Yes, but we have the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in himself, he has community. Interesting. And he says, let us make them 
in our image. The following chapter in Genesis 2, 18, it says this, and then God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a helper, a companion. Ladies, can I tell you that God didn't call you woman, we called you woman. God's title for you was a companion and a suitable helper. You were the only thing on planet Earth that is suitable to help out us knuckleheads. Come on, ladies. Come on, ladies. I'm with you. All right. And, but nonetheless, he saw that there was isolation. He saw that obviously he was with them, but he saw that there was loneliness there. And he said, it wasn't good for someone to be alone. So watch this. He, he made us, he made us in community for community. He made us in community for community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make them in our image to reflect our nature. What is our nature? Within ourselves, we have common unity. Therefore, they should live with unity. So relationships are important. And in this series, we're going to talk about your relationship with your loved ones. We're going to talk about relationships with coworkers. We're going to talk about relationships with difficult people. Who wants to go over that today? Anybody want to go over that today? Yeah. Relationship with different people. We're going to dive into, because why? Because God made us in community for community. I do a lot of research outside of just, you know, obviously leverage in the Bible, making sure that the Bible is the foundation of every teaching. But, but human, human behavior specialists say that there are four pillars to every good relationship. The four pillars of every good relationship is this care. So if you're going to be in a relationship, you have to actually care for the other person. Big dot, right? You have to care for that person. Not only do you have to care, you have to have something called competency, right? When I say competency, that's the ability to do something well within the relationship. My wife's love language is acts of service. Your boy knows how to do the dishes. Okay. And I do them well. And this is what I don't do well. And ladies, you know what I'm talking about. I don't put them in the dishwasher well. but they get cleaned well. You understand what I'm saying? Right? I don't understand to this day. Like, show me. Yeah, that don't make sense to me. I'm just going to do it my way, and they're going to be clean regardless, okay? But there's some competency in it. So there's care, there's competency, and I like these behavior specialists because they, they like to preach in alliteration, so I think they're just unsafe preachers. But care, competency, and, hey, character. That there needs to be integrity in every good relationship. I say this to married couples all the time. Your, your relationship is as sick as your secrets. Your relationship is as sick as your secrets that you keep. There needs to be character. There needs to be integrity within the relationship. And the last thing is consistency. All of us know that when life gets busy, right? When life gets hectic, that's when some certain elements of our relationship start deteriorating. And if you don't have that consistent connection with your loved one, that's when things go sour. I actually say that things go silent before they go sour. So it's consistency is key. And listen, here at Fervent Church, I'm always going to tell on myself. So I think I'm pretty decent with care. I think I'm pretty decent with competency. I think I'm pretty decent in character. But you know what the thing I suck at is consistency sometimes. And it's something that I'm working on, even convicted as I'm preparing this sermon for you, because I lack that consistency. My best friend, there are sometimes we don't talk to each other for months. Praise God, we pick up where we left, where left off, and, but there are certain moments where we need that level of consistency in order for us to have a solid relationship. Sometimes it goes too long without encouragement. Sometimes it goes too long without accountability. And every good relationship, every good relationship requires those four things, care, competency, character and consistency y'all with me this morning all right and you could get by with three out of four a, a, you know a table could still stand with three legs but a solid table has four legs those four pillars need to be active in every one of our relationships relationships are so important that i believe that relationships they actually be markers in our lives you should be so good at relationship that you become a marker in someone's life when i met mike watson right when i met jill when I met Doug, when I met this, these people, my life changed. Relationships should be markers in our lives. And you should be a marker in someone else's life. God cares so much, so much about relationships. 
that he sent his one and only son to restore the relationship we had with him. That's how much he cares about relationships. Our main text this morning is going to be 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. I want you to listen to this for a second. There's going to be a lot of scripture today. So if you're taking notes, I hope you don't have arthritis. All right. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. My dream, my fantasy is to have Justin Timberlake type of vocals. Because one day I want to sing that verse and say, go. But I can't hit that note. Mike's like, no, you can't. No, stop it. Even the angels are holding their ears. But the old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God, for through Christ reconciled us to himself. You know what that word reconcile means? It means to restore friendly relations. Okay? He reconciled us to himself. Somebody praise God for that. I couldn't do it. I couldn't be, I couldn't reconcile this. He reconciled us to himself, the Bible says and gave us, watch this, the ministry of reconciliation. So he reconciled us to himself, and then he gave us, he empowered us to say, okay, I care so much about this relationship, I wanna restore this relationship, now I'm putting you on the path to do the work of restoring other relationships. So he reconciled us to himself and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting us the message of reconciliation. So we not only have the ministry of reconciliation, we have the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So when we talk about, I'm an ambassador of Christ, you know, when you're a bodybuilder and you're wearing that ambassador for Christ t-shirt, where's Steve at? He ain't here today. When you're wearing that shirt, that, it, what is it talking about? How are you representing God? Did you represent God when you're in the ministry of reconciliation? The ministry of restoring friendly relationships. He cares so much about relationships that he gave his one and only son to do that. And so... We always talk about that we're not interested in religion. We're interested in having a relationship with God. I want to experiment with something this morning. I want to look at it. What would it look like if we pursued this relationship as if it was an actual relationship with God, an actual relationship with a person? Because sometimes we don't think about it that way because God is spirit, and so we— we don't interact with them like I do with Mike, right? We don't inter I don't interact with them like I would do with some of you. There's a, there's sometimes there's a lack of a physical connection, but, but what if we looked at it through the paradigm of an actual relationship? Because we all know it. It's about having a relationship with God. Okay, I want a relationship with God. I remember just a few weeks ago, so one of the aunts texted me, and they said, I miss my relationship with God. And I was like, oh, that's it. That's it. To actually have not a relationship with God, because again, we don't have a relationship. I don't have a relationship with you if I just call you when I need something. I don't have a relationship with you if I, if I talk about you and never talk to you. I don't have a relationship with you if I just show up to your house, do what I'm supposed to do, and then go home like everything doesn't matter. Y'all pick up what I'm laying down? And I think for some of us, we think we do have a relationship with God because you show up on Sunday. Awesome. You do have a relationship with God because you do your daily devotions. Awesome. You do have a relationship with God because you read your prayer book. Awesome. But I wonder what might it look like if we actually approached it as a real, actual relationship. And if it's true, then how do we mess up that relationship? How do we mess up that relationship? How do we interfere with that? And... This is what, I don't want you to walk away thinking that the, your relationship with God is fragile. And here's why. Your relationship with God isn't fragile because he's not fragile. All right? He's not fragile. He's very stable. Okay? So when I'm being clay, 
he's not. Okay? When I'm acting a fool, he's not. Okay? So, so yes, there are some times that I interfere with the relationship, but I want to I wanna impart to you this confidence that not because of anything I've done, but because everything Jesus did, I, the Bible says I can approach the throne room with confidence because I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. And, I, and as Jesus is, so am I when it comes to God. And he reconciled us to himself. So if the, mess, if the, if the relationship is messy, it's all on you, boo. But the relationship is not fragile, and we need to thank God for that right from the beginning. It is not fragile, because he's not fragile. But what messes up our relationship with God? What messes up our relationship with God? Point number one, me. Amen? Let's pray. Kidding. <laughs> that would be the easy thing. Yeah, I'm the one that messes up. No, here's what I believe. Number one, what messes, what messes up our relationship with God, I think, is this. And again, we're going to approach this as a real relationship. What messes up our relationship with that is a communication breakdown. Communication breakdown. Again, as if it's an actual relationship. Somebody please agree with me on this. When there's a lack of communication or poor communication in a relationship, it can lead to misunderstanding, conflict, and resentment. Right? When, when there's a lack of communication or poor communication, we get to misunderstandings, conflict, and resentment misunderstandings. There are some times I believe that we misunderstand what God is doing in our lives. I do. There are times I believe that we have conflict with God, right? Isn't there other moments where it's like, God, like, like I know you're good, but I ain't feeling you today. There's conflict there. Sometimes there's resentment even, and it's a result of a communication breakdown. It happens in natural relationships, and it also happens in our supernatural relationships, right? And it all breaks us down to a communication breakdown. Now, what? how do we communicate with God, everyone all together? Come on. It's prayer, right? And if you joined us in our collective nights, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to do a study on 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 some authentic prayer, all right? Because I think I've grown up in, in, and I've tried many different churches. I started off in a Catholic church and then I got, my whole family got saved in an in in African-American church. And then I went to a Spanish Pentecostal church and I tried all the different flavors of churches and they all pray differently and, 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 and they all pray you know, somewhat passionately. And then I went to a, a more reserved church than reformed church where they like to whisper pray. So I've done the loud prayer, hallelujah, praise God. And then I've done the whispered prayer, God, you're faithful. So good. It's so good. I don't know why we stuck our teeth before. So good. Yes, God. Hallelujah. Do that kind of stuff. So prayer is our conversation. It's our connection. It's our communication with God. There was a study, 298 Christians were in this study a few years ago. And the study was about closeness to God. And let me stop real quick, because some people are going to be like, you know, some of the big theologians in the room are like, God is omnipresent, which means he's everywhere at all times. And I agree with you. I'm talking about the feeling of closeness or the feeling of feeling apart from someone, right? Some of you, you might be sitting right next to someone shoulder to shoulder and still feel emotionally distant, right? There have been moments, I remember living in, in North Jersey in Hoboken and, and taking the subway to Manhattan. And I, we'd be shoulder to shoulder with people and I would still feel alone. Okay, I'm talking about the feeling of it. Yes, God is everywhere at all times, absolutely. But with the feeling of closeness or the feeling of distance. And so they took 298 Christians and they did this project where they made them that half of them wrote a one minute, everybody say one minute, one minute prayer to God. And the other side, the other group, the other side of the group, they did just a one minute reflection, a very neutral daily reflection of their day. And they did it every single day. And then at the end of it, they asked them to rate themselves at the end of every day from one being that you feel very far from God and seven that you feel very close to God to rate themselves on their, phys uh, their emotional proximity to God. And this is what happened. Those who prayed to God, one minute, again, say one minute, one minute to God felt 12% closer to God. Just one minute a day. Just one minute a day. 
It, that, that just reveals to you just the power of prayer. And I don't want you to feel convicted because at the end of the day, I've been in ministry for now 20 plus years, been a Christian for a few decades now, and there, there's never been a moment in my life, and some of you aren't going to like this, but I'm just going to be honest. There's never been a moment in my life where I felt like I was praying enough. I've always felt like I could pray more. Anybody out there with me? All right. You, I'm not talking about those who feel like you, could, you, you should be praying more. We all should be praying more. But I want to talk about the difference between that you, got, you don't feel like you're praying enough, and some of us know that we're not praying at all. Hello? You know you're not praying at all. We've all been a victim of this. Girl, I'm going to pray for you. Oh, the sheep. Right? You text someone prayer hand emojis, and you didn't pray at all. I'm not talking about that right there. It's a communication breakdown between us and God when he's given us complete access. Again, God has not given you a junior Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. No, you mean, you know, Pastor Mike, no, I'm talking to you. You, there's no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit. You have the full Holy Spirit living inside of you. That burning, removing, yoke-destroying power lives and dwells inside of you so you have access to God. And even when you don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit intercedes on your behalf. We're called, First Thessalonians tells us, and as said, we're called to pray without ceasing. To pray without ceasing. First Thessal Thessalonians. I wonder how, like, Spain, Spanish people say Thessalonians, because, you know, they say things like Barcelona, Thessalonians. The first Thessalonians 5, 7, 17 says, praying without ceasing. Th th does that mean that we're constantly walking around, praying under our breath? But it's this constant communication that I have with God, because without that constant, consistent communication, there's a communication breakdown. And listen, relationships, when there's a communication breakdown, here's what happens you eventually start having bad conflict resolutions when there's a communication breakdown. Married couples, can you back me up? Dating couples, can you back me up? When there's bad, and there's a communication breakdown, conflict resolution ju it just it isn't there. It's not even present. There is no resolution. Because when, when there's a communication breakdown, when you're in that argument, you throw everything you can into that argument, right? You start reaching deep into the archives, right? And then you know it's really bad when you start mentioning your parents. Yeah, well, your mother. Bad conflict resolution because of a communication breakdown, right? And I think it's the same way with God. Sometimes we have bad conflict resolution. Sometimes we lead to misunderstandings. We lead to suspicion even to God. We lead to resentment towards God because it's bad. Conflicts are a natural part of relationships. I will say that. Conflicts are a natural part of relationships, but poor conflict resolution skills can lead to ongoing disaster in every relationship. And what's required is communication. That's what's required is communication. Because again, what do you do? What you, 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 you have this resentment and you have the strain on the relationship when there's no lack of communication. And remember I said like misunderstanding. I think the Bible says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. I think intentionally, I think intentionally God doesn't always just give us the plan on a silver platter. Because I think he allows a built-in system of reliance of his presence in our lives. Because if he just gave us the answer on the silver platter, we take the answer and we just run with it. But his, his, his word is a lamp unto our feet. That means like sometimes he only, uh, he only illuminates the next step. Right? The, no, eliminate the whole mile. No, just the next step. Why? Why? Because he wants there to be a dependency. And even more than that, sometimes I take a step and he goes, now we're going to take another step. No, no, I don't like that step. I don't like that step, God. Why are we going to take that step? And he doesn't answer me. And so it requires a little bit of wrestling. And some of you are frustrated with God. Because why are you, why, why do I, this always has to be a struggle? Because here's what I believe. I believe that wrestling can create space for intimacy. So maybe those things that you're like, God, just give me the hand sound. We'll be good. No, you'll be good, but the relationship won't be good. 
because we just walk away and only come back to him when we need something. But he's a word is a lamp to our feet. So wrestling, you know, the Bible talks about Jacob. He wrestled with God. He wrestled with God. And I think that's proper sometimes to wrestle with God. Because if you don't communicate, folks, there's a breakdown in that communication. And then we start assuming the worst. Start resenting God without this level of communication. Again, what would it look like if this was an actual relationship? Y'all getting anything this morning? All right, so there's a communication breakdown. Second thing that messes up our relationship is a lack of trust. Lack of trust. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with some of your heart. Don't correct me in front of all these people. You're right. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Yeah, but God, my understanding is really good sometimes. Like sometimes, like I know, so I'm a smart dude, God. I'm a smart dude. So why do, why do I always have to just trust you with all my heart and not lean at all on my understanding? And then I get frustrated. Here's what the rest of the verse says. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So there's sometimes, why am I walking down this winding road? I understand I'm smart. Why aren't you making my path straight? Because I'm not trusting you. And that's way easier said than done. Don't get it twisted. Your boy has your back. That's hard. Trusting in God is not easy. But all of us know when it comes down to relationships, trust is an essential part of every relationship. Can I get a big amen? All right? And the lack of trust can cause significant damage in any relationship. Right? That's why when trust is broken, it requires a lot of, help, a lot of heavy lifting to fix the problem. Okay? But there are some times when we don't trust God. There are some times in relationships when trust is broken, write this down, when trust is broken, and trust is broken by three things. It's broken by dishonesty, it's broken by betrayal, and it's broken by secrecy. Dishonesty, betrayal, and secrecy. That's how trust is broken. And again, because of our communication breakdown, we get to this place in our lives and when we stop trusting in God because we feel that he betrayed us. God, you've forsaken me. God, you, know, you, you didn't show up when I needed you to show up. Is this anyone? I know this has been some of my prayers. Just read the Psalms. You see David just crying. A little crybaby David was throughout the Psalms. But yet, that, it's true. We all get to those moments where it's just like, come on, God, you, you kind of betrayed me. But because of that communication breakdown, we don't assume the best in God. We assume the worst in God. Some of us, we misinterpret even God's discipline in our lives. This is what the Bible says. He disciplines those he loves. He disciplines those he loves. When he does discipline you, it's not punishment, it's discipline, number one. Number two, when he disciplines you, he doesn't discipline you to destroy you. He disciplines you to develop you. But because once you're in that state of resentment, then everything he does annoys you. Can you say that about God? I told you he's not fragile, he could take it. He's a big boy. But am I right? You know, when somebody is in the bitterness room of your heart, everything they do annoys you. The way they chew their cereal, the way they slept their coffee, you just want to scratch their face off. Am I talking to anybody? Right? But sometimes we allow our life to let God be in that bitterness room. And here's a crazy thought. Maybe some of you today need to work on forgiving God. Is that too heavy? Because what does forgiveness mean? Forgiveness means that, like, if you need to forgive someone, it's because you feel that they owe you something. There's some debt there. And for some of us, I think you need to release the debt. God doesn't owe you a thing. And to forgive God, because without that forgiveness, you will never get to the place where you can actually trust that he's a good God. And he's a good father that gives good gifts to his children, even when it's a butt whooping. Parents, you know what I'm talking about? Those who believe in spanking still, you know, like after you do it, you're like, you know, I hit you because I love you, right? 
<laughs> his discipline is not to destroy you. His discipline is to develop you. And you can walk around assuming the goodness of God when you learn to trust him. Y'all getting this? I love this. One day uh, our staff was together and it was during a very turbulent time in our church. And uh, I think she's comfortable with me saying this test for uh, Pastor Steve's wife. She said this phrase, I have like a quote book that I always just like curate quotes throughout life. And I'll never forget what she said this because it was just so, it was so God breathed. Um, she says, hey, you know what, everyone? You could be angry and upset and still trust God. And it's easy for you to say, girl. But it's true. I think you can. You could be angry and upset with him and still trust him. Right? I know that there are times where I upset our boys. But they know at the end of the day, they still trust me. They trust my heart for them. They trust my love for them. They trust that I'm trying to help them become the best version of themselves. You could be angry at me all you want, but you can still trust me. And I think God's saying the same thing. Last thing, y'all good? So you have a breakdown of communication. You have a lack of trust issue. And I think the last one, and, and this is gonna sound heretical for a second. So just hold it for a second, all right? Everybody's now awake. When I said heresy, look at y'all, nosy people. <laughs> in a relationship, number three, inattention to the needs of the other person can mess up the relationship. Your inattention to the needs of the other person can mess up a relationship. We say that again because that's what needs to settle in. Your inattention of the needs of the other person can mess up a relationship. Well, Pastor Mike, God doesn't have needs. He is all sufficient. And I agree with you, but he does have desires. He does have desires. And the reason I said the word need is because I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that I want to treat this like an actual relationship. Your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your, your kids, they have needs. And the relationship breaks down when you're inattentive of, those per of that person's needs. And so, yes, God doesn't have needs, but he sure does have desires. And here's the beautiful part about his desires. He doesn't just desire things from you. Everything he desires from you is actually for you. Everything God desires from you is actually for you. We split a bunch of Bible verses just to prove it to you. Because we got to understand that the neglecting the needs or the feelings of anyone you love can lead to the feeling of loneliness, frustration, and again, resentment. So let's look at the desires of God. Psalm 51, six says this, behold, you God desire truth in my inmost being. And in the hidden parts, you make me know wisdom. Okay, so he desires truth. He wants truth in my inward being. Again, it's from me, but it's also for me. Why does he desire truth in my inmost being? Because he knows that it's the truth that's gonna set me free. He desires freedom for us. That's what he wants. So he desires some of us, hey, let's, let's continue to put the truth inside of my inmost being. This is the, some of the things he desires. Uh, in Matthew 12, 7, he says this. This is Jesus. It's written in the red. And he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And he's also quoting the Old Testament. And this is the same verses written in Hosea. And he, he's challenging the Pharisees at this time because they were messing up their job. Their job was to show mercy to the people around them, not, up, not hold them to these unreasonable standards that tradition has taught them. And he said, I desire mercy. So he wants mercy for us for us to receive mercy, for us to give mercy. That's what he desires from us in a relationship. He desires, you know, if you want to just categorize all these, basically he desires worship, love, and surrender. That's what God desires from us. Worship, love, and surrender. John 4, 24 says this, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We don't worship him with just song and lyrics. We don't worship him with just musicians. We don't, it, it's not just about showing up. Our time of worship should be a spiritual thing. And some people are like, I didn't feel worship today. You're not supposed to feel worship. He's supposed to feel your worship. Oh, you're throwing a deduct temper tantrum to prove my point. 
I don't even like that song. It doesn't matter. Did God like that song? Are you worshiping him in spirit and in truth? Not in opinion and criticism. I said it. Right? That's, how we're, that's what he desires. Mark 12, 30. And he says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. What does he desire? Everything. He wants everything. He wants you to love him with everything you got. Everything you got. And you know what the cool part about that is? Because like, there's a, there's a guy in our denomination. He's a really big college professor and he's older. And a lot of people kind of revere him. He left a big legacy uh, in our denomination. And uh, he came up to me at our last district conference last October. And he looked at me with his, uh, he has like that old man anointed scrawl. Everybody know what I'm talking about? And he goes, he goes, Mike, why are Christians so boring? He's like, we just don't know how to have fun. Just good, old fashioned, holy fun. And I said, I don't know why we're like that, man. I'm trying to fix it. I'm trying to lead by example. And the beautiful part about this, you know, God actually wants that from us. Ready? In Psalm 37, 4, he says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When was the last time you felt like that word delight could also mean enjoy? Yo, you, you know you can enjoy God? Some of y'all are so afraid to laugh at a joke. You know you can enjoy God? Do you know that hell can be fun? No. Yeah, it can. He wants, you to, he wants you to enjoy him. We can enjoy the presence of God. He says, delight yourself in the Lord. He desires us to delight in him. Hebrews 11, 6, it says, this, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. So he wants our faith. That gives him pleasure. He desires that. The faith that we have in him. The faith, well, even if things are going well, I'm still going to believe that you're going to redeem all things. You're going to reconcile all things. And you will, you will turn it out all good for those who love you. My faith is going to be in you. My faith gives you pleasure. Psalm 119 says this, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. Their whole heart. Isaiah 29, 13 says this, And the Lord said, because the people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me and their fear of me is a commandment taught of men. He wants you know what he desires? Your whole heart. He does not care. I think church right now, you, we think that he wants our emotions, right? Honor me with your lips, honor me with your mouth. You think he wants our emotions. He wants your emotions. He just doesn't want your emotions. He wants your emotions. He says, you say all these things with your mouth, but your hearts are far from me. You're far from me. He wants it all. He wants it all. And the beautiful part is we can give it to him. Some of you feel like that's impossible. I can't give him all. We could work on giving it to him. He, he delights in our pursuit. The Bible says that if we seek him, he will reward those who diligently seek him. So if, as I'm pursuing him, even though I mess up, I'm going to keep on falling forward into the arms of my Savior. Come on. I'm going to keep on falling forward to the arms of my Savior. Because any little human step I take, he takes a big God step towards me. And so why not give him what he desires? And he desires it all. I want to talk to some of the people who don't have a relationship at all with God, and that's okay. But I want to tell you that he desires a relationship with you. Two more verses very quickly. First Timothy 2, through to 4 says this. This is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires, what does he desire? That all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. He desires all people to be saved. That's his desire. Other verses say this, 2 Peter 3, 9, it says that the Lord is, is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, 
not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. His desire is for everyone to step into relationship with him. Isn't that amazing? Like, I know maybe some of you have heard that way too much in your life, and it's kind of like white noise, and I'm sorry for that. But stop for a second that the creator of the universe desires a relationship, a one-on-one relationship with you. Oh, whoa. What? You mean a relationship with pastors, right? No, a relationship with you. Yeah, but you don't understand. I gave someone the finger on the way here. He still desires a relationship with you. He's not the fragile one in the relationship. I promise you, he's not the fragile one in the relationship. He wants you to draw near. And nothing, nothing can stop him from loving you. Nothing. Nothing. Some of you feel like life is beating you up. Some of you feel like you're just too dirty to approach him. Nothing, nothing can stop him from loving you. Get that. If that's the only thing you get this morning, it was worth the price of admission. Nothing can stop him from loving you. Here's what I want to do. Let's all stand. Team, let's go. I want to give an opportunity. Is every head bowed, every eyes closed, and there's nothing magical about this. I just wanted to give the opportunity for some of us in this room to um, do one of two things, either to start a brand new relationship with Jesus or to reconnect with Jesus. I want to tell you right now that nothing else matters before this moment. All that matters is your decision right here, right now. He desires that you give your life to him. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to go back and fix anything. He's going to help you do that. But right now, it's all about a decision. All you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he's Lord. And that he lived the life I couldn't live and he died the death I couldn't die. So that I could be reconciled with the Father. So if that's you today, I want to make this very private. I'm not going to ask you to come up. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. And, and this is not just for tallies or numbers. I just want to pray specifically for you. So if that's you today, just raise your hand discreetly. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep your hand up while I pray for you. Father, you know every story behind those hands. You know all the mistakes we've made, the mistakes we're making, and you even know the mistakes we're going to make. Yet your blood covers it all. You paid for it all because of your unending love. Father, every hand that's raised, I pray right now for a newness. Let them know, seal it on their heart, that the old is gone, the new is here. And we step into a brand new relationship with you, covered by your mercy and led by your presence to be the best version of ourselves so that you can get the glory. You are Lord and Savior of our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Clap your hands if you received anything today.